Welcome back to the damage report, everybody. I am not your host, John Idarola. I'm Francesca Fiorentini filling in for the dragon daddy. That's right, the stepmother of all dragons is here. We got this on a Wednesday, y'all. We've got such a good show while John is away, getting a much needed vacation. Thank you so much for being here. And because it is Wednesday, of course that means, of course that means that we have Mr. J.R. Jackson with me. Whoa. Close to the camera, JR Jackson. What's up? <laughs> What's going on? How you doing, man? I'm doing good. I had to step in uh, in a pinch. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, shout out to all the wonderful producers, uh, to Marissa and Sophie and everybody at the Damage Report for putting our incredible show together. We got some good news. We got some failing up news. Um, we've got a little clap back from Illinois to the Texas abortion law. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a good hour. Yeah, um, we. I, I know you're on regularly with John, but I still don't know your dragon name. We have to establish <laughs> these things before we get started. This is important stuff. Um, I don't have a dragon name because oh I'm not a raging nerd. But <laughs> I no, I think it's Fantastic Dragon. It's whatever you want. It's sort of like my ethnicity. It's like whatever you want me to be, oh. I could be that. <laughs> <laughs> Shape shift. Shape shift, exactly. Don't get that started, JR. You know that's not going to go over well on the internet. For just because a shape shifter. <laughs> um, but if you guys are here, hey, why don't you like the stream? Do all the things you normally do when John is here. Uh, share the stream, like the stream. If you're on Twitch, what's up? I don't know what things you can do there, but I know I have an emote with some fly hair. So please do that, use that. Um, and uh, also remember, coming up right after this show, but not on the Damage Report stream is Indisputable. That's right, Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. Uh, YouTube.com slash Indisputable for that. Uh, indisputable TYT, make sure you head there. Uh, that starts right after the Damage Report, so do not miss that. They got a great show. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Metzl is his co-host uh, and he's debating Brad Palumbo. And I need to know who Palumbo is, because I don't. And I, but I feel like he's still going to be destroyed by the doc. So watch that 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific, right after the damage report. Uh, but first, we got a show to do ourselves. Jay, are you ready for this? Oh, I'm ready. Let's do this. Bow, 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 bow. Okay. Bow, bow. John doesn't do music, so that makes sense. All right, let's do this. So California can breathe a sigh of relief, one filled with a little bit of or a lot of bit of wildfire smoke because Governor Gavin Newsom has defeated the efforts to recall him just a couple years into his term. Dashing the hopes of, of course, Larry Elder, the AM radio star. The attempt to recall Governor Gavin Newsom has failed. The AP, AP called the race for Newsom who had won 62% of the vote. Uh, in a landslide in 2018, but less than an hour after polls closed on Tuesday, about 65% of the nearly 9 million ballots counted by 1 a.m. Pacific time said the governor should stay in office. Now, a lot of that, the speed of that is thanks to the fact that a lot of the ballots here in California were in fact mail-in ballots. And that, what do you know, is actually a much quicker way of finding out results, especially when there is early voting. You can mail it in early and whenever you want. Let's go to this graphic. So uh, shall Governor Gavin Newsom be recalled? 63.9%, uh, about 5.8 million votes said no. This was as of last night, 68% in and only 36.1% said <laughs> yes. 3.2 million people. Let's see who was out in front. Should the governor have been recalled? Um, there you got Larry Elder with 46.9% of the votes. Uh, Kevin Pafrath or meet Kev. Kevin, I really don't care to meet, but now I feel like I owe him one. So I should just watch his YouTube videos. A lot of other Kevins uh, were in the mix. And then we'll get to some of the, the bottom runners as they say. But um, JR, what are your top note thoughts on, on this defeat of the recall? Yeah, well, this was kind of expected as people were saying, you know, we knew it was California, we knew Newsom had his issues that many Californians were upset about. But when you're presented with this kind of thing, we saw it before, we had recall elections here. Uh, Gray Davis back uh, when Schwarzenegger ran through. So it, we, we've experienced this before, but the difference now is, um, Schwarzenegger had that whole like Terminator thing that people fell into and 
I don't yeah. know. But um, this situation, people found out who it was that they're voting for and the way he approached things. And 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 just his general hatred for anyone and equality and diversity. You can't do that in this kind of state. So I mean, I honestly saw this as a test for Republicans to see if they could float this whole isolationism, hatred in a state like California. Yes, we got plenty of people that hate each other, but it's not for the reasons that they think it is. We have a lot of division and differences and all that type of stuff. But I'm not sure how they ever really ever thought this was gonna be a thing. And that's why I think before it even happened, when he took on the Donald Trump, hey, I lost before I lost approach, they already knew this was gonna happen. So I feel like their 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 objective here was kind of Simply just to say, hey, we tried and see how much yeah. these Democrats suck. It's it was kind of be a, supposed to be a setup for 22 and midterm elections, and I'm just not sure if even that really worked. No, no, and, and yeah, this is obviously a Democratic heavy state. Turnout was actually fairly high compared to what would a normal sort of you know midterm random uh, uh, vote here. So that's good. You know, nine million votes is nothing to sneeze at. Yes, there are forty million Californians, but still nine million is pretty good. Uh, you're talking about Larry Elder, who was the front runner. Let's go to that quote that he has. This is from the Sacramento Bee. He says. Uh, to his rally of volunteers, um, let's be gracious in defeat. Mm -hmm. Elder said at Orange County rally for volunteers is even if some of his supporters called on him to not accept the results, we may have lost the battle, but we're gonna win the war. You know what, I'm just gonna preempt that and say that he'll be moving to Austin, Texas. In like 10 months, okay? He's a radio host, okay? We know where they go. Comics and radio hosts who think they're gonna be so called canceled, they're gonna move out of the state. We've got bigger fish to fry and more problems. Like for me, I've absolutely been of the mind that we gotta get this recall out of the way, that it's a giant waste of money, you know, almost $300 million for this. A guy who was elected just a couple years ago, it was a total like a, a, a sad loser move from Republicans. You know, that started even before the pandemic was a thing. So they tried to blame it on his handling of the pandemic. And turns out that didn't even really hold water. Let's look at some of the polling. It turns out Californians largely supported Governor Gavin Newsom, which is a hard thing to do during this time as so many governors governors have been on the ropes. But polling from the Public Policy Institute of California showed his approval rating remained above 50% throughout the pandemic. With weeks to go, the Institute's poll showed 60% of Californians approved of Newsom's handling of, of that pandemic. And you gotta say that for as loud as Republican Californians or Republican Karens wanna be about mask mandates, about shutdowns, for as many, you know, sort of loud privileged business owners that there are in this state. There are a lot of essential workers, there are a lot of working class people, yeah. there are a lot of people who believe in science who don't want to be at you know the whim of a global pandemic and don't want to die. So there's like more kind of, Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're kind of living in this well at least a lot of Republicans I think are living in this isolation a state of thinking each state is so separate that other states don't see what's happening say in Alabama, Florida specifically, Missouri, Texas. So we see the things that governors, the moves that governors have been making during the COVID response, during the vaccine response, and the kinds of things they've tried to shut people out from. And although we can talk about how, oh my God, those guys are doing so badly, but we see it and we can compare it to what's happening here. Sure, Gavin Newsom has problems with the with with way he's been handling things in California. Nobody was disputing that. The difference is, is how are we doing? compared to other states. We look at COVID numbers, we look at vaccine rates, we look at the way that people are, are, are spoken to mm -hmm. <laughs> and rights that are given to folks. And there's things that Californians like just about how the approach we have to treating us in these ways. Sure, we have issues with our taxes and what we're, what they're being used for. We don't have healthcare systems that we're looking for as well, but we're still trying. Now, if we look at just these, these, these brick walls that are put up in other states, like Texas, when it comes to women's rights, Yes, that those things weren't specifically on the ballot, but they were on the ballot in people's minds. Cuz we're like, should we accept another Republican that talks like Ron DeSantis in Florida? When Ron DeSantis is is attacking school officials and attacking businesses, talk about attacking businesses. So we see what's happening in other states and we compare it to these Republicans that are trying to run in this state that what Larry Elder's his 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 decree was on my first day I'm going to ban all masks and then have lunch. Is that a winning argument in California when California's like, hey, 
We'd like to go ahead and get by this whole COVID thing so we can stop wearing our masks responsibly. Yeah, We don't like that type of rhetoric here. Yeah, and also it's hard to sell uh, having no minimum wage in a state with a lot of income inequality where people are struggling to make rent, you know, where it's that expensive. It's like, no, 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 we don't, please don't do that. No, and the other thing I'll say, you know, we have to actually in this state, and I'm sure the rest of the country is looking at California going, what? How is that even possible? Even if you could recall your governor, why wouldn't the job then immediately go to the lieutenant governor, right? As we saw in the case of New York with Andrew Cuomo. Right. And that's a perfectly logical question. And I know a lot of people now are going to be looking at actually how to stop the recall process from being so easy, from having so few signatures required in order to trigger a recall. Once again, it is a fraction, the number of signatures required, a fraction of the total population of this state. And then suddenly we're spending $300 million on this like total bogus process. When once again, y'all, Governor Gavin Newsom is up for election next year. So for progressives, for leftists in this state, for Republicans in this state, we will all have another chance come next year. Yeah, yeah, and maybe it's a warning shot to someone like Gavin Newsom to to take things in a certain way, and not necessarily be afraid of Republican pushback and all stuff. But maybe his own base or maybe his own voters and supporters want something different from him, or someone that that would take that spot. So hopefully they're on notice at least to to treat things differently going forward. Oh, they are they are mad dogging him. I know a lot of grassroots organizers right now and hats off to all their work, but who are like, mm-mm, Gavin, now you're ours. Now we own you because we <laughs> helped you defeat yeah. this. Yeah. But let's move on to some people who are uh, having a tough time taking this news, specifically not really reporting the news. So there has been a uh, level of denialism from the right about the defeat of the recall of Governor Gavin Newsom and the fact that Larry Elder, AM radio host, will not be the next governor of that state. Um, Brian Stelter of CNN has been watching. One America News Network, look, whatever you think of Brian, someone's got to watch that network, so <laughs> kudos to him. Um, and he writes on Twitter, One America News Network's handling of the GOP defeat in California has been so, so weird, I have to tell you about it. The polls closed more than 10 hours ago, the recall failed, it wasn't close. But OAN has not reported the results of the recall a single time that I can find. I've scoured the transcripts and watched the morning news coverage, zero mentions. But it's weirder that OAN keeps talking about the recall. Officials are fin finishing up the ballot count. Different anchors reading the same script said at both 5 and 7 a.m. Eastern. But they're not admitting what AP, CNN and everyone else reporting la reported last night. The recall failed, Newsom prevailed. And apparently they keep running generic news packages that describe why the recall happened and followed by recaps of Kevin Faulkner and Larry Elder's concession speeches without explaining that they lost. Okay, <sighs> so I obviously you see there's a little bit of biting off the Trump playbook and just rinse and repeat here for people in California or people around the country. So you're never gonna actually say, you're gonna show Larry Elder being like, let's be gracious in our defeat and then simultaneously never report it. It's, it's, it's news now for these right wing organizations. Again, this is how they got on the map. OANs and the Newsmax of the world got themselves on the map when Donald Trump was in office, who said a bunch of things that didn't make sense or who wouldn't fully talk about what was happening. This is the approach. So if you're gonna be a, a news network that still caters to people like, the Trump wing of the party, which is honestly, I'm not sure you can call it a wing anymore, more than just maybe like the torso of the party. You know, you don't really just flying uh, in circles. You know, that's <laughs> when one wing it just kind of pop, 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 pop. pop. <laughs> I think it's just happening because as you talk about, it's a constant circle of the same talking points. Donald Trump is still talking about 2020. Oh my God, and how he didn't lose. How much longer are people going to take? Having to keep dealing with this, so OAN is still on that. They're, they haven't had a chance to flip the page and say, should we report about what's happening and then we complain about it? Because at least yeah. Newsmax did that. Because there was this one anchor on Newsmax who was upset, like 55% of the report, and it was generally over already. And he said, well, they like to say that Bill Clinton won because of his looks. Ugh, this guy Newsom, he's gonna win because of his hair. <laughs> is that really it? Is this what news organizations should report that somebody won because of his hair? His hair, not because of what 
the opponent, the leading Republican that you've had on millions of times has been saying about what he'll do when he gets into power. Totally, also the hair, not that good, let's just be real. It's a weird <laughs> like game show host guy, smiley, too much pomade, you know, it's it's do something else, <laughs> uh, Bruce Wayne. No, so okay, well Fox News, maybe, maybe they're actually telling their viewers what is actually happening in terms of this recall. Uh, I guess they haven't tweeted about it at all. <laughs> so Aaron Ruper says, uh, it was quote tweeting Fox News is tweets. Chrissy Teigen said she had fat removed from her cheeks. No shame in my game. Nearly eight <laughs> hours later, Fox News still hasn't tweeted about the California recall result. Instead, Jana Kramer and Jay Cutler photographed together for the first time during a night out. Like, I wow. love when Fox, whenever they don't want to report on something, was it during the impeachment where Hannity just like cuts to a crazy car chase? Like, whenever they don't want to cover something, they just become TMZ. They're like, okay, so. We don't want to talk about the political reality, but we have to get ratings. So we're going to be <laughs> cops meets TMZ go. Yeah, celebrity stuff. If if all else fails, hopefully it's spring break time. We can show some bikini women on the beach. Right. All those <laughs> things are the go to's. They probably keep it in a nice package in the back to make sure if it's bad news, let's run these things. Yeah, well, so Larry Elder wasn't a sore loser, I guess, yet. Uh, but there was someone who was, Let's let's go to this next clip. And I can't believe that this many people actually voted to keep him in office. It's a shame. Honestly, it's a shame. You kind of get the government you deserve. So that was Caitlyn Jenner, who, yes, was a gubernatorial candidate in this recall election that was handily and swiftly defeated. And Caitlyn polled at 1.1% of the vote. That's with 68% reporting. Who knows? Maybe she can, you know, sort of make up some headwind against Armando Perez Serrato, who is her second in line. Um, <laughs> yeah, so she was 13th of 46th, not the worst. That's like, but you know, you know, not 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 the best. And she was definitely she knows. below the four Kevins, I think, right? She the yeah, four Kevin, she, yeah. Exactly, exactly. She it should have been yeah, Caitlyn, Kevin, Jenner. I don't know. Some something. <laughs> clearly, the Kevins were winning on this, but yeah, she's. You know, the whole thing of her getting into the race was so ridiculous. Such a weird publicity stunt to begin with, and she, Republicans didn't even like her, which was the worst thing. They haven't really stuck their necks out for her for to defend her when it comes to trans rights. She hasn't even come at and stuck her neck out for trans people at all. Uh, agreeing with Republicans when it comes to like uh, transgender uh, people playing in like supposedly they're, they're assigned gender at birth when it comes to at, be, uh, athletics, blah, 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 blah. You guys know what I'm saying, but we get the government we deserve. Yeah, 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 Caitlin, it's California. Like people didn't sadly, Newsom wants to say that they voted for him, we didn't. People voted right. against Larry Elder and against Caitlyn yeah. Jenner. And a lot of people feel like if it weren't for Larry Elder and some of those gems that I know the damage report and TYT have been digging up about the crazy things he said, right? Like uh, slave owners are owed even more reparations uh -huh. than slaves, former slaves themselves, like that maybe it would have been different, right? If they actually had a front runner, if they could agree on somebody. But again, it's California. And as many people have pointed out, the GOP doesn't really exist here as an entity. Well, if they had an agenda, if they had something that they said they would do, if they complain about homelessness, crime, the economy, COVID shutdowns, vaccines. So when you complain about all those things, the next step, it's so weird how this works, is to say, well, you'll do. Those, that step is never, ever taken. So what are you gonna do about the homelessness problem? Why are there so many homeless people? What are you gonna do about about the fact that we have the with businesses that suffered during COVID? And what are we gonna do to get it back in time for people that could still be affected to go through this? What are we gonna do about death rates? What are we gonna do about the, the, the Delta variant? All these things that are happening that you yeah. say that so many Californians are so upset about, which they are. What are you gonna do about crime? You gonna just increase the police force because you're not paying attention to the fact that the police force does so many things that Californians don't like? And we're trying to reform that. You can't come into a state and ignore the will of the voters 
and tell them what you're gonna do. It's exactly the opposite and expect results. This doesn't make any sense. It's one of the reasons why Joe Manchin continues to hold up everything that the Senate does is because he goes, well, I'm from West Virginia, so I, it's a conservative state, I can do stupid things. You can't go into California and then tell Californians everything you believe in is garbage. It's just, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Right, look, we have aspirations, we know what we're for. Whether or not we can get those things is very different. But imagining that Governor Newsom is somehow a far left socialist, everything but we progressives know that and we gotta push him. So we gotta take our first break, sit tight, BRB. What up, Oh, I'm back, Oh my gosh, this we're still doing it? Yes, we're still doing it. Um, all right, well, a little bit of sad news for the entertainment and comedy world. Stand up comedian, writer, and actor Norm MacDonald has died from cancer, which he battled quietly for nine years. He was only 61 years old, and maybe some folks aren't old enough to remember how wonderful he was. But he's a comedy legend, had been on SNL for four years, had incredible characters like Burt Reynolds on Jeopardy. Um, he was the regular host of Weekend Update, just an incredible dry sense of humor, amazing delivery, super funny, super sharp. Uh, and that's why you're seeing an outpouring of support uh, and sadness from a lot of fellow comics and former co-workers at SNL. Uh, John Stewart said on Twitter, no one can make you break like Norm MacDonald, hilarious and unique, F cancer. Um, Breaking right is like breaking character where you're just gonna laugh. It's like when you know folks at SNL or on the show will just like bust up in the middle of the sketch. Sarah Silverman wrote, Norm was in a comedy genre of his own. No one like him on this planet. Please do yourself a favor and watch his stuff. He was one of a kind of all time, one of a kind of all time. And Seth Rogen, oh, F word. I was a huge fan of Norm MacDonald. And I essentially ripped off his delivery when I first started acting. <laughs> I would stay up specifically to watch him on talk shows. He was the funniest guest of all time. We lost a comedy giant today, one of the all time greats, RIP. Um, so, uh, uh, so Francesca, you, you, you're funny, you're a comedian. I don't know if that's a term anymore. I, I like don't think so. Weird. Yeah, it was, weird. <laughs> it was weird when it happened. Um, what? So I feel like people that did the game know how hard it is to do what he did, seemingly effortless. So this thing, I, when I was at SC, I knew who Norm Donald was, and I was like, yeah, he's the guy from SNL, sure, sure, sure. And he came and did a show for us. It was like this quick live show, and we got it for free. It was in this big event, and I was like, I'll go because everyone's going. I don't care about Norm Donald. I left stomach hurting, tears streaming. It was <laughs> the funniest thing I've. And I, at that point, had ever seen from a comedian in live performances. And he, he just kind of, it looked like he got up there and was just talking to us. And it wasn't that at all. But we thought yes. so. I was like, this guy's just talking. And I don't know what he just said, but I can't stop laughing at it. Yeah. It was delivery, it was, it was content, and it was timing. And that stuff is way, way underrated for how hard it is to do the way he did it. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and he also, like, He's got a biography, an autobiography that is actually just full of like fairy tales and lies. Like he just embellishes, and that's part of the humor of it. Apparently, it's amazing. I haven't read it yet. But yeah, the guy, like that's the best kind of comedy and the best kind of stand ups is when they're just talking and the punchlines are coming and coming and the, you know, the tags are coming and going, but it doesn't always feel like set up, punch, da da da, you know, rim yeah. shot. Like that is much more, you know, that everyone's got their personal favorite style, but when someone makes it look that easy, like I think Norm MacDonald did, and you know, it's not everyone's favorite, but that sort of like effortlessness, you know, and he had to work really, really hard at it. But he also, you know, he's a stand-up for like 25 years, I believe. So that's a long time. And he very much um, continued his career after SNL as well, even though that's what people remember him for, or being the drunk guy in the pool in the movie Billy Madison with Adam Sandler. Oh. Um, but I just want to read this one last thing. This is from the New York Times and Obit talking about how great McDonald was. And he had a bit, he had a lot of bits about dying. And he had a bit about his uncle dying from cancer. So McDonald once talked about an uncle dying of cancer, skewering how we now describe people suffering from that disease as quote, waging a battle. Because that means the last thing you do before you die is lose. I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that if you die, then the cancer also dies at the same time, McDonald said on Comedy Central. That to me is not a loss, that's a draw. 
<laughs> yeah. It's even so even in that. And it makes sense. Like the thing is, it's funny that it still makes sense. I'm sorry, because you read that and it's very, it's very uh, particular to it and it makes sense. But there was something that stuck out to me from uh, Milana Ventrub, who's the AT&T actress who plays the AT&T girl. Yes, yes. She's funny, she's really funny. I admit her once, she's really cool people. And so she, she took a screenshot of an interaction she had with Norm McDonald. And uh, Norm said, how long have you been doing stand up, Milana? And she goes, about three years, Norm, but lately I've been doing stand up as my dad. I put on a mustache and talk about how disappointed I am in my daughter. And that's her that's her bit. Norm responded, haha, do you say you're disappointed that your daughter has stooped to dressing like you and acting like you are disappointed in your daughter? So then she says that, I mean, she, she posts that and she goes, he just gave me a suggestion that's funnier than my entire set. Just like <laughs> off the top of his head, like, and it's just the way he was. Like he'll he'll find three different levels to a joke that no one will think of that makes sense, but it's also hilarious at the same time. And she's like, I, I gotta throw the rest of my set out. Cause <laughs> he's just gave me a suggestion, so. I know a lot of people who knew him and who met him and have amazing stories. I, I met Kevin Nealon, uh, who's a lovely delightful man and also co-star with uh, Norm on SNL, but I never was able to meet Norm McDonald. But anyway, RIP to a real one, everybody check out his comedy, uh, that is okay. I think it's totally fine when somebody passes and you didn't know them well to go back and their memory lives on. So yeah, yeah. Um, moving to just almost a more sad story. Uh, and just a story of failing up, a doctor in Idaho who once called the COVID-19 vaccine needle rape has been promoted to Idaho's top health board. Uh, this is Dr. Ryan Cole, a pathologist with no public health experience, um, who of course has been championed by the GOP in that state. Um, he got appointed to this board at a time when there is a raging cases throughout Idaho to the point where they are sending patients into Washington because their hospitals are so overwhelmed. Um, more about him, of course, Dr. Ryan Cole is a celebrated figure among anti-vaxxers. He made headlines in July calling the vaccine the clot shot and needle rape in a presentation to America's mm -hmm. frontline doctors, a group known for COVID-19 misinformation. Oh My God, I can't believe there's a group called frontline doctors. Like, of course, of course it is. Like essential workers who don't believe there should be a minimum wage. Like that's exactly like whatever they say they are, they're the opposite. Um, so apparently he, one of the things he did and has done is convinced a charter school called Peace Valley in Idaho to not wear masks. Uh, that was a sort of notch in his anti-vax belt. Uh, and he was appointed to the board at a time when only 38% of the state has been fully vaccinated. Um, and the state system, the healthcare system was at the brink. Two weeks later, the system broke. 10 of the state's hospitals were put under crisis protocols under which patients are told they may get care below the usual minimum standard, like being treated in makeshift wards or without proper equipment. On that same day, the day that they're like, you're gonna maybe have to be treated in a waiting room and or not at all and or in the parking lot. Idaho's largest public health board, the Central District Board of Health announced that Cole would become its seventh member. Um, the CDH is Idaho's biggest health authority covering Ada, Boise, Elmore and Valley counties. Its board is elected by 12 commissioners, three from each county. Cole made it onto the board thanks to a backlash against CDH restrictions, which propelled coronavirus skeptics into positions of power. <sighs> so <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's a democratic decision, JR, but <laughs> that's what it is. So this is how things work now. You can you can be a doctor that has absolutely no basis or background for the thing that you're now becoming an authority figure on, simply because enough people don't like what they're being told. You can say things like clot shot and needle rape, and that makes sense enough to people to promote you to a position where you'll be advising folks on what they can do going forward with their lives in a state where things aren't working out that well. So instead of looking for a different route, let's just make sure the people that are, are having issues or maybe aren't getting the right information continue to get the wrong information. Isn't there supposed to be a correction here? We just talked about the, 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 the attempt at recalling Gavin Newsom in California. Their whole push was, we never changed the, the trajectory of our state, things are going badly. If things are going badly, why would you put someone in that's gonna exacerbate it and make it even worse? I don't understand this process here, but 
we, you know, we, a lot of for a lot of Republicans that talk about going to see your doctor before you get the vaccine. Oh, go see your doctor, see your doctor, see your doctor. And by the mm-hmm. way, I agree. Go see your doctor and have your doctor say what they should do about it. If your doctor says something like, "Oh, I mean, I don't know about that clot shot," you know, that needle rape. If you're sitting in your doctor's office and your feet are dangling off of the little bed, and then and the plastic, the paper plastic under your butt that's really uncomfortable to sit on. Yes. And then <laughs> everyone has experienced the trust. And the doctor says, "Oh, you mean that needle rape?" You should stand up slowly and be like, um, "I'll be right back. I need to use the restroom." And leave. No one is going to listen to their doctor in a one-on-one situation that says needle rape and clot shot because it's crazy. But for some reason, if he's promoted to a public position, he can say needle rape and clot shot, and suddenly all of that is great. Why is that different now? Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing, and I didn't mention this, but yes, he is a doctor in front of his name, but he's not actually a specialist in, but in any kind of virology or public health or anything. He's a specialist in dermatopathology, which I don't really know if I'm pronouncing right, but it's basically just diseases of the skin that have no no relation to respiratory conditions like COVID-19, of course. But you know, he is a celebrity. He's been on Infowars. He has been uh, he's been lauded in you know uh, uh, by the Idaho Freedom Foundation. Um, so he's a talk show darling, and that's all that it takes to be promoted nowadays is to just be full of bluster. I mean, he, I mean, honestly, if Trump had lasted another term, I feel like this guy would have been next in line, right? <laughs> uh, to head like the, the Department of so Health and Human Services. <laughs> yeah, 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 Surgeon General, why not? Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, I mean, and and Idaho, I know, is sort of like it. It is a battleground state. I mean, it is and it isn't. But you know, I feel for a lot of people in Idaho who do who have been vaccinated. That thirty eight percent, thirty nine percent who have been vaccinated, who know that you know it is a red state, and there are a lot of people who are not going to believe in the vaccine. Um, of course, one last thing about this guy, he he's. One of those, uh, the Delta variant is caused by the vaccine people. He told Insider he's concerned the vaccine is causing mutations. Like the Delta variant, a false claim that's been repeatedly debunked. He's instead promoted, drum roll, the anti-parasitic drug Ivermectin as a COVID-19 treatment. Uh, the drug is currently considered at its best unproven and it's at its worst danger, a dangerous distraction from better treatment. Um. <laughs> Again, we've said this so many times. So if you're gonna trust in ivermectin, who makes ivermectin? Who will prescribe ivermectin? People that make ivermectin are probably drug makers and people who would prescribe it are probably doctors. So if you talk to doctors and then you don't trust drug makers, what would make you take this one? Because because some politicians and pundits decide to promote it now. This, like, the, the, the basis behind any of this, and this has been said before, it's not like that's a new thought process. But it's been said so many times that if you're gonna, if you're gonna trust something, what's your basis for trusting it? You have to have this level of humility if you're gonna learn something. Yeah. So if you're gonna go into a situation like, oh, I don't know what's going on, what do I find out? Even if you listen to this guy, you have to at least have some level of humility to say this guy is smarter than me. That's not even what this is. This is he is saying what I need to hear to continue to believe what I already believed with no basis in fact and reality. That's no, all it is. Yeah, and imagine him on this board. Like imagine the other healthcare professionals, people who have went to school for public health, people who are like serving on this board trying to prevent the skyrocketing cases in Idaho, prevent Delta from you know doing further damage, having to make patients go over to cross the border to get into Washington to be treated. And being like, how are we supposed to make it work with a guy that like, you know, doesn't believe that up is up and down is down? Like that is, you know, what is he gonna do? I feel like it's like a jury, you know, but like a you know, 12 angry men, except the dude who is decrying everything is actually wrong, you know, and you're like, I don't there, there's no meet middle ground there, right? Like, how are you supposed to make ends meet? But that's of course because folks have been fed so much poison mentally, not through the shot, but like, you know, listening to InfoWars and others, like. That's what they want to see. That is who they want to support. You know, that's who they want representing them in their the highest health board in the state. Um, and the last thing I'll say, you you mentioned why would you go see this doctor at all? And I think that's really interesting because people do tend to see, you know, w- when it comes to this stuff with with COVID, it's like 
People are going to see like chiropractors, we did a story about. They're going to see dermatologists. They're going to see, you know, your local medicinal weed, you know, prescription <laughs> writer, dude. Like anyone who can write you a note that says you can't wear a mask because your back hurts, you know, like, yep. and this is just another case. It's like anyone who did like two months of med school, let's promote them. And somehow that's more scientifically sound in these folks' minds than someone like Dr. Fauci. And and finally, Idaho is a place where I know it's quite rural. And I imagine that most citizens of Idaho residents have a very difficult time on a, on a regular day getting the healthcare they need, getting being able to access a doctor, being able to ask the questions that they want to ask about, you know, their own health, about the vaccine, about the virus. That shouldn't be lost on on all of us. That when we come out of this pandemic, you know, we do need a more robust public health care system all over, yeah. so that we don't have these deserts of folks who are like, you know, being fed so much misinformation because they really don't have a local doctor to see. I wonder if that's part of it. There's a political angle to this. One of the part of this, we don't want enough people to have to feel they need to have this access to health care, which will again change the politics that we've always pushed. Because if something like this happens, where this pandemic is hit. After something like this happens, people may be have this awareness of, I don't have enough access to find out what's going on with true and accurate information. Maybe I should be given that yes. through the amount of money that I pay back to my government. And maybe that's just something they wanna keep people from having, so they pump the fear instead. Absolutely. All right, we gotta take our second break. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Damage Report. Francesca Fiorentini filling in for John Iderola, but with J.R. Jackson. Uh, we got we got more news, J.R. It's, I'm tired already, but you know what? We're gonna go to the reserve tank, we're gonna get through this. <laughs> I'm literally on an empty stomach, but that's okay. I have had coffee and thankfully I can taste it. Uh, and I don't have COVID yet. All right, let's do this. So. There's a new Trump book, and that means a new set of fresh horrors that we <laughs> didn't know existed, that we didn't know if we want to know existed. <laughs> um, this time, it's all about how unhinged Trump was in those waning days of his presidency, um, probably well after the Four Seasons debacle, um, and what a top general, General Mark Milley, did to try and stop Trump's worst impulses. And this is all in the new book called Peril by Bob Woodward and Robert Costa. So twice in the final months of the Trump administration, the country's top military officer was so fearful that the president's actions might spark a war with China that he moved urgently to avert armed conflict. In a pair of secret phone calls, General Mark A. Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, assured his Chinese counterpart, General Li Zhuozheng of the People's Liberation Army, that the United States would not strike, according to a new book by the Washington Post associate editor Bob Woodward and national political reporter Robert Costa. So he's making calls, not allowed to necessarily, not told to necessarily make the calls, but taking it on himself to make two of these calls. One of them took place on October 30th, four days before the election that unseated Donald Trump. And the other, two days after the Capitol siege carried out by his supporters in a quest to cancel the vote on January 8th. Um, so it's interesting to parse out these two calls. The first call was apparently because Milley reviewed intelligence suggesting that Chinese, the Chinese believed the United States was preparing to attack. That belief, the authors, authors write, was based on tensions over military exercises in the South China Sea and deepened by Trump's belligerent rhetoric toward China. In the call, Milley said, General Lee, I want to assure you that the American government is stable and everything's going to be okay. <laughs> we are not going to attack or conduct any kinetic operations against you. Uh, so he continues, he says that uh, in the book's account, Milley went so far as to pledge he would alert his counterpart in the event of a US attack, stressing the rapport they've established through a back channel. General Lee, you and I have known each other for five years. If we're gonna attack, I'm gonna call you ahead of time. It's not going to be a surprise, <laughs> which, which is my favorite part. It's like, <laughs> so we think maybe he thwarted an attack, but then he actually was just like, okay, but I'll let you know if we do. <laughs> I'm not sure what this guy's gonna do, but if I find out, I will let you know. And that's okay, so that's, that's where the drama and the controversy comes in. It's his warning for potential attack because he doesn't know. Anytime one of the, again, 
a top general in the US military is gonna talk about how we don't know what this guy's gonna do before uh, January 6th and also afterwards. We just don't know what he's going to do. And yes, that's a very big part of the story. It's intriguing, it's surprising, uh, it's potentially damaging because we don't know how sometimes these backdoor uh, uh, operations and conversations happen. But what we're missing is the fact that we had a president who the top generals had no idea what he was willing to do from the from the standpoint of potential nuclear war and threatening other countries because he's that focused on staying in power because he absolutely there's nothing else matters in life to him except for himself. And this is not an assumption. This is not just me saying it. This is obvious. Everyone sees that. We see that from his followers. We see what happened on January 6th. We see the way he speaks to people who once supported him. Other politicians, if they're not on his side 100% of the time, he's like, I'm done with you. If someone has their loyalty to me, I'm all about it because it's about me. There's no reciprocation for this loyalty. So if you have a guy who's now cornered, all he can do is attack. He talks about it this way. This is the way he is. So mm -hmm. if he has the power of the military to do something aggressive like this, and we've seen politicians do this before, engage in conflicts for the sake of somehow galvanizing energy and, and support around themselves, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? That's what, what we see as sane politicians do. How about a yeah. crazy one? Of course he could. Right, and this is after he already proved the lengths he was willing to go, you know, strong arming Ukraine into digging up, you know, imaginary dirt on his rival Joe Biden. Like, yeah, he's been saying this is the stuff he would do. And I gotta say, when I read this story, I was actually relieved. I'm gonna be 100. I was like, oh, thank God someone was looking out for us because <laughs> in those waning days, I think we all, let's be real, it was a dark winter, not just because of COVID, but because of Donald Trump and being, you know, the angry little diaper boy that he was the entire time and being like, this dude is still president. Lame duck Trump is the worst Trump, you know, like Obama was like, lame duck Obama was the best version of Obama. Lame duck Trump was the worst version of Trump. You know, and we were, I, I'm, I kept on racking my brain thinking, look, all it takes is a military incursion. All it takes is a fabricated or a real um, terrorist attack or some kind of, you know, military aggression from an adversary like China, like Iran. And that's it. We're starting a war and they'll be sort of like, oh, martial law, sorry, we can't change presidents right now, 100%. right? Like that could have easily happened. And I think the fact that General Milley was sounding the alarm behind the scenes actually like, gives me relief that there is a safeguard, that there is somebody. So I want to go to the second call that he made around after the Capitol insurrection. On January 8th, Milley called senior military officials into his office at the Pentagon to review a process of ordering strikes, including those involving nuclear weapons. Milley went around the room, verbally confirming with each officer they understood that they were not to take orders from anyone else, on anyone unless he, Milley, was involved in the process. Which I'm like, mm. thank Yo, that, you. <laughs> that's 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 extreme level event type of stuff. Like we need to make sure this doesn't happen because this is the last rail. So if if I don't know about this being a General Milley there, then we could go into a disastrous situation. So he needs to confirm and make sure. And this is one of those things that we've all, I don't know if everyone's always wondered it, but as the Trump administration was chugging along, and they talk about the deep state and the, the, the career politicians and people that are involved in it. And they lambasted the fact that anyone that's a stable a, a, a government entity that's working within administration is there. I was like, I wonder who is left. I wonder who is left in what positions that can still do something in case we get to the extreme extreme that we're not privy to hear and see about before it happens. So yeah, the comfort you had probably comes from the fact that, man, oh my God, there was a guy, Oh, there was a guy. And even if he broke protocol and broke some rules and all that stuff, hey, you know what didn't happen? Nuclear war. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny because John isn't here to say this, but obviously every time a new Trump book comes out, we're always like, why didn't we know when it was happening? You know, right, right. And, it, and it's funny because there's been a lot of obvious pushback and obvious, not pushback, outrage from the right. So Marco Rubio is calling for Mark Milley's resignation. Other representatives, Josh Mandel of Ohio, Donald Trump put out a statement. 
And the opening <laughs> line is, if the story of dumbass General Mark Milley, the same failed leader who engineered the worst withdrawal from a country, Afghanistan, uh, blah, 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 blah. Don't need to read the rest of that. But the fifth word is dumbass. Yep. How about <laughs> an ex president that speaks like this based off of something that he was doing? Now he's trying to play. I don't know if you can get to, I'm gonna let you get to whether or not he's playing it both ways. Because he says fake news on the story. Because one of the reasons Millie was trying to figure out how to corral this, this energy and keep it from falling strictly in his hands was he was ranting and raving, running around and cussing people out every day. Yeah. So if you have an unbalanced person in office, you need to find some way to balance it. Now he doesn't, Trump does not want that narrative to be seen as true, because it is. Because that makes him look bad. But he also wants to make sure that the narrative of, oh man, Millie really stepped outside of his bounds. He needs to be tried for treason. He wants that part. He can't split it down the middle and say, well, that part's untrue of me going crazy. But then this part is true about him going behind my back. Well, in order for him to go behind your back, you might have to be doing something for him to think that you're crazy. You can't play both sides of this. And that's always what they do. It's shooting the messenger and not actually what happened of potential aggression against China in those waning days. Yes, and that is exactly what I was going to say was that here is some uh, something we found out that where someone actually stepped up in the moment. One of the people pushing back on General Mark Milley is actually Alexander Vindman, who testified against Trump in that first impeachment trial. If you guys remember, uh, he was a former lieutenant colonel who said, yes, you know, I know that Trump put pressure on Ukraine. And and he's saying now that Milley should resign if he in fact did this. Well, here's a difference. I mean, no disrespect to Alexander Vindman or his service or his testimony, but he did this after the fact, right? What was happening during it, right? And this is something that General Mark Milley is trying to prevent active war, right? And I feel like that is going a <laughs> length for our national security that not a lot of, not enough people did during the Trump years, to be honest. Yeah. I want to turn to before we before we end, we have one more one more angle on this. So turns out that Steve Bannon did have a pretty big role in pushing the January 6th insurrection, according to this new book, Peril, by Robert Robert Costa and Bob Woodward, that has just come out. Steve Bannon on December 30th, convinced Trump to return to the White House on January 6th, according to this new book. And at a time, Trump was in his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida. January 6th was the date set for Congress to vote on certifying the 2020 election of now President Joe Biden. And it's what he said that's even worse. He says, you've got to return to Washington and make a dramatic return today. You've got to call, I don't know what his voice is, call Mike Pence off the effing ski slopes and get him back here. This is a crisis, people are going to go, what the F is going on here? We're gonna bury Biden on January 6th, effing bury him. So not only do we have all of those statements that we we heard at that Stop the Steal rally from people like Representative Mo Brooks, from Rudy Giuliani, from Trump himself saying, you know, we're gonna go there, we're gonna take the Capitol, etc. Like he, you know, we're not gonna back down. But you've got Bannon saying, effing bury him. To Donald Trump. To Donald Trump, who likes this kind of threat, who who in his rallies before he even became president was rallying people up to attack, punch them in the face, I'll pay for your legal fees. He knows who he's talking to. He knows his propensity to, to call for violence. We know about this stuff. This, this isn't this isn't a mistake. This is one of those things where politicians then see their foot soldiers of the Trump army start to attack and go, who would have thought they would have attacked? All I said was to go and attack. All I said was that they're your enemies <laughs> and that we're we're uh, the original uh, colonists and we're George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Let's go attack. That's all I said. So he knows who he's talking to. He knows his role in this. He knows that he's one of the few people that Trump listens to and he knows how to talk to him to get him to listen to him. Man, if we're gonna talk about treason and, and preparations and all that stuff. Hey, by the way, this January 6th commission is still investigating, still going through a lot of things. They might be interested in some of these phone calls and communications. Yeah, and yet, you know, you have the FBI saying there was no plan. This was like more, it was just sporadic. It was sort of like a coalescing of, of uh, extremists. No, 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 there was a plan. Uh, and of course, Trump later pardoned Bannon for his federal conspiracy charges for defunding a bunch okay, of people yeah. from that wall. Jesus. Um, 
But, but of course, uh, we gotta leave it there for the linear folks. Thank you so much for joining here. You can still watch on YouTube on the other side. Sit tight, JR and Francesca gonna be right back with the damage report. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.